This is the second of my two lecture series about source separation in neuroscience. In the previous video, I talked about uh, neuroscience as source separation. And in the previous video, I was talking about temporal source separation and spectral source separation. So there the idea was that we're looking at the time series data from one electrode or from one neuron or something or population of neurons. And we say that the sources can be mixed. So from different signals and also noise, it all gets mixed together into the same electrode data. And to the extent that the different sources have representations in different frequency bands, we can use spectral analyses or time frequency analyses to try to separate out those different sources that are all happening simultaneously. Okay, so um, and now in this video, I'm gonna be talking about spatial statistical methods of source separation. So here is this slide again about the diagram of, of sources and sensors uh, and our resulting components. Uh, I talked about this quite a bit in the previous video, so I will just go through it again briefly as a reminder. So these microphones here are representing sensors. These are the manifest variables. These are things in the universe that we actually can measure. We can attach numbers to them. But these are not the things that we are fundamentally interested in. Instead, we are fundamentally interested in these sources, these latent constructs, which cannot be directly measured, but they project to all of these other sensors at the same time. And so uh, what we want to do is um, come up with a way to, uh, let's skip forward a bit here. So uh, we want to come, come up with a way to uh, weight the different uh, sensors such that the weighted combination of these sensors gives us something that hopefully is a decent approximation of these latent constructs, these true sources. So rather than doing all of our data analyses, our statistical analyses on each one of these microphones, each one of these sensors individually, we instead try to combine them in order to obtain something here called a component or a, a sort of a, an estimate of a source. Uh, but in this video, I'll be calling them components. And the idea is, is that, you know, if we make the correct assumptions about the sources and how they mix, then we can define these weights in a particular way that allow us to have some confidence that these components are a good representation or good reconstruction of these underlying latent constructs, these true original sources. So then these are the things we analyze instead of these individual manifest variables. So then uh, in the previous video, we looked at temporal filtering. Here in this video, we're gonna look at spatial filtering. And again, the, I, the concept is the same. So we have the data from lots of different electrodes and we are combining these different electrodes. So X would be a matrix of, of data. So it would be channels by time. And W will be a, a vector of weights. So a single number for each channel. And then the weighted combination of all the different channels gives us a component. And then that's the thing we do data analysis on. So to motivate this as a concept, this is also, by the way, related to dimensionality reduction. So we start off with 256 dimensional data. Each channel corresponds to a dimension. And now in this picture, I've reduced the dimensionality down to two. So we go from 250 dimensions down to two dimensions, but presumably these two dimensions give us more meaningful insights into the brain compared to looking at each of these individual 256 dimensions. So to motivate this concept of spatial filtering and also dimension reduction, I'm gonna show you some data from these. Are, this is a, a YouTube video that I've embedded here. So this, the title of the YouTube video is Retinal Waves Recorded from a Mouse Explanted Retina at Postnatal Day 11. Okay, so let me just uh, set this up by telling you a little bit about the history of, of trying to understand what the retina does. So a long time ago, like half a century ago, people were, uh, scientists were studying the developing retina and trying to understand how the retina develops, how vision develops. So they would record from an individual cell in the developing retina. And the activity that they measured in the retinal cells seemed to be totally chaotic, random, unpredictable. And so the conclusion that they came to, which was actually you know, a, a valid conclusion based on the data that they had, the conclusion that they came to was that 
The developing retina is just totally chaotic. It's random, it's spontaneous, it's unpredictable activity. And then at some point, you know, later in after birth, that's when the retina starts developing. But then the neuroscience techniques uh, improved over the decades, and then they started doing imaging. So what you're looking at here is an image of an explanted retina. Now you can, uh, so it's a little bit of a simplification, but let's just imagine that each pixel in this image is a cell, is a neuron in the retina. So when uh, it's blue, when the pixel is blue, that means that the cell is not active. When it's red, that means the cell is very active. And when it's an intermediate color, we'll say it's it, you know sort of medium active. Again, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one mapping between pixel and cell, but you know that that's fine for present purposes. Okay, so the question is, how many pixels do we have in this image? Well, I don't know exactly. I didn't count all the pixels, but let's just imagine this is 100 by 100. It's probably somewhere around that order of magnitude. So if this image is 100 by 100, then in total there are 10,000 pixels in here. Now, this is going to be a video playing over time. So we can ask whether we should model each one of these pixels totally independently of each other or uh, whether there's some like low-level features that can explain some of the dynamics, the spatial-temporal dynamics in this uh, video. Okay, so let's start playing this. It's over a minute long, but we might not watch the whole thing. Okay, so you see that there's activity changing over time. And now I would like you just to watch this video and think about what words come to mind to describe the movie that you're seeing. You know, just think of some, maybe some verbs or some adjectives. What what words come to mind? Okay, so there's there's different conditions, uh, but we don't have to. Uh, that that's not so relevant for now. So what are the what things come to mind? So I guess you're probably thinking of words like wave, cor spatial correlation. There's there's these patterns. There's bubbles. They're moving around. You might be thinking of, uh, so I'll stop this now. You might be thinking of this uh, this game called The Game of Life by Conway. I think it's called Conway's The Game of Life. If you haven't heard of it, then it's worth looking up. And maybe I'll keep this going, actually. So it's called uh, Conway's The Game of Life. And it actually just starts with a couple of simple rules. And it describes patterns that look remarkably like this. And so basically, you know, the idea that I'm trying to express here is that Although there are 10,000 individual pixels in this image, you probably get the sense that we don't need to have 10,000 sets of equations with 10,000 independent sets of parameters to understand what's going on here. So we might ask, how many equations do we need to understand these videos, to understand these dynamics? Now, I don't know exactly how many equations we would need, but it might be somewhere on the order of five or 10, let's say somewhere, let's say around 10, just as an estimate of the order of magnitude. There's something about the spatial autocorrelation. There's something about the speed, the propagation speed of these waves. But anyway, the point is that there is some meaningful structure in uh, this signal. And that structure is what's important. Maybe that structure uh, changes d depending on the, the day of uh, development. Maybe that uh, structure depends on the chemical bath that uh, this retina is sitting in and so on. But the idea that I'm trying to express here is that each individual pixel is just giving us a little bit of data. We don't actually care about the individual pixels in this image. What we care about is the underlying latent constructs. And so what we want to do to understand these latent constructs is find some way to combine the activity across the different pixels over space and over time in order to understand what these uh, what the changes in pixel values are telling us about the underlying dynamics that are really governing this system. And those might be yeah, maybe five dimensional or 10 dimensional or something. Okay, so now let me uh, illustrate the same concept, but uh, but in a in a in a picture here instead of in a movie. So the kind of traditional way of doing data analysis for multi-channel data analysis is you have all the data from individual channels, 
and then you apply your statistical analysis to each of these data channels separately, and that gives you a separate result. So you have 250 channels, so you get you apply 250 analyses and 250 results. Now, that is called the univariate, or you might call it the mass univariate approach because we are massively doing univariate analyses. Univariate means that there's one variable. So each uh, variable, each channel is considered its own separate thing. So is this univariate approach appropriate? Is this a, an appropriate way to, uh, to approach uh, modern uh, large sample data sets? Well, you know, there's a couple of problems. Uh, we run into uh, multiple comparisons issues. And uh, there's going to be, you know, if we're doing mass univariate analyses, we're going to have to select data somehow. And so selecting data might be a little bit subjective, possibly a little bit biased, hopefully not too biased. Uh, there's also going to be difficulties dealing with individual differences. If, you know, some particular XYZ location in the brain is is you know different in your brain than in my brain but furthermore all of these samples that we're drawing they're not all independent samples they are all dependent on each other they they are dependent over time and they're dependent over space so what happens at you know the activity that you record at this electrode is very strongly correlated with the activity you record at this electrode so is it appropriate to treat these two electrodes as completely separate statistical entities, given that they're going to be so closely related to each other. So, uh, so that's going to generate some problems for inferential statistics, also related to multiple comparisons. But, you know, we shouldn't just think of this as being a problem. There is information in the dependencies. We saw that in the video as well, uh, in the, the video of the developing retina. So there is information in the autocorrelation structure and we want to leverage that information not try to avoid it or suppress it and there's other motivations for moving from a univariate to a multivariate uh, analysis approach and that is uh, that signals and noises get mixed so we are going to try to unmix them and also neural coding uh, it seems is fundamentally distributed so therefore looking at one single neuron at a time might give us important but limited information, whereas looking at information content distributed across multiple neurons or across multiple uh, circuits or brain regions is likely to give us even more information. Okay, so those are some uh, statistical and theoretical motivations and also practical motivations for applying uh, spatial filters that simultaneously act as dimension reduction methods. So. In the rest of this lecture, I'm going to briefly introduce you to three spatial filters, three methods for uh, doing both multivariate analyses and dimension reduction analyses. And the ideas underlying these three methods are slightly different, but uh, there's commonalities across these different methods, and that is that they seek to leverage the correlational patterns across many different measurements, whether these are different electrodes, uh, in EEG or sensors in MEG, whether these are different uh, voxels in fMRI or different neurons that you measure directly, invasively, or whether these are, you know, different uh, questionnaire items or behavioral readouts. So basically anytime you have a lot of uh, information where there's some correlation structure and you want to extract some components from them by weighted combinations of the different variables. Okay, so here we have independent components analysis, principal components analysis, you might have heard of these two methods, generalized eigen decomposition, you might not have heard of this method, but it's actually a, a pretty cool method, and I will spend a bit of time talking about this. So um, three different spatial filters that I will focus on here. Now, these are not, uh, yeah, in some sense, these have uh, similar goals, but uh, they have different maximization criteria. So they're going to be working differently. And let me uh, touch back on, on this slide for a moment. So these different methods, PCA, ICA, and GED, are basically different ways of making assumptions about what's happening on the left side of this diagram in order to devise these arrows on the right side of the diagram. So these arrows on the right are going to be different for different algorithms because different algorithms make different assumptions about what's happening in the data. So they're all listed here, but you don't have to worry about uh, yeah, understanding this table here because I'm going to uh, explain this over the rest of this video.
And by way of an introduction to PCA and GED, I want to start by talking to you about covariance matrices because many spatial filters, not all of them, but many spatial filters are based on covariance matrices. So a covariance matrix is the result of multiplying a data matrix by its transpose. And uh, essentially it encodes all of the linear pairwise relationships across all of the different uh, combinations of, of channels. So here is a data set, and you can see already looking at this data set that there is some spatial structure. There's some autocorrelation in the, the different channels. So these channels up here are all positively correlated with each other. They all go up and down together. These channels here all are positively correlated with each other. They go up and down together. But when you look at this group of channels and this group of channels, you see that they are negatively correlated with each other. So these channels go like up, down, up, down, and these ones are going down, up, down, up. So there's positive correlations, negative correlations, and there's also a couple channels that just seem to be, you know, they're sort of off doing their own thing. They don't really care about joining team A or team B here. So this is what the, uh, the uh, channel covariance matrix would look like from this data set. So the, the color value at each pixel corresponds to the correlation between this channel and this channel. So here we see a group of channels that are correlated. Here's another group of channels that are correlated. And then here you see the negative correlations between this group of channels and this group of channels. And you also see that, you know, the like this one at the top is not correlated with any of the other channels. Covariance matrices are really great because they contain a lot of information in a very compact representation. In fact, a covariance matrix is all of the linear pairwise interactions across the entire data set. So all of the linear interactions are encoded into the covariance matrix. Now, you might be thinking, ah, oh, but come on, Mike, linear is stupid because, you know, the brain is more complicated and there's all sorts of nonlinear things. So that is true. There are definitely uh, nonlinear uh, feature uh, ways of combining information uh, across different uh, channels or different neurons. But uh, covariance matrix is uh, limited to the uh, linear features. And that's actually not necessarily a bad thing. That's usually, in fact, a good thing uh, for both theoretical reasons and practical reasons. Remember, we are not limiting ourselves to data and uh, linear data analyses, we can apply nonlinear data analyses. It's just the way of mixing the different electrodes together or the different channels, the different manifest variables together. That part is linear. Linear filters are also generally very fast and reliable and easy to compute. Uh, so they have a lot of good statistical properties as well, numerical stability properties. Anyway, that's a, that's a longer discussion, but it is something to keep in mind. Okay, so how do you create a covariance matrix? Well, covariance is actually very similar to a correlation. And of course, you are familiar with correlation, at least conceptually. And so this is the formula for a covariance matrix, uh, for a, co well, a covariance element. So the jth, kth element in a covariance matrix would be uh, the, uh, the, the data time series X and data time series Y and then uh, you mean center, so you subtract the mean, subtract the mean, and then just multiply them point by point, and uh, you can scale by n minus one. That is actually the same thing. This is just a longer way of writing out the dot product between channel X and channel Y if the, uh, if the channels are mean centered. So you would have to mean center these data uh, vectors first, and then you could write it out in this compact linear algebra format like this. Now, of course, you will remember this term, the dot product, from my previous lecture where I talked about the Fourier transform uh, and, uh, and how the Fourier transform is implemented by computing the dot product between a complex sine wave and a data time series. So it's all the same operation here. Okay, so basically the idea is we just multiply data x by data y over all of the time points, and that gives us a covariance value between x and y. Now, here I have a screenshot of the uh, Pearson correlation coefficient from Wikipedia. And it's interesting to note that this, what I've written out here, is uh, the same thing as the numerator of the correlation coefficient. Now there's, uh, there's no denominator here, and there's also no scaling factor. So the scaling factor is easy to explain away, and that's just because 
this scaling factor here is present in here, in this term, and in this term. And these are square roots. So if you pull out that, uh, that uh, normalization factor here, this would give you, you know, the square root of 1 over m minus 1 times the square root of 1, 1 over m minus 1. And then uh, that's in the denominator. And then here we have uh, the same term up here. So that just cancels out in the Pearson correlation coefficient. And then uh, the denominator is essentially just normalizing for the, the, the magnitude of these vectors. Okay, so this tells us that a covariance and a correlation are almost exactly the same thing. A correlation coefficient is basically just a covariance that is normalized to scale from minus 1 to plus 1. Otherwise, you can think of them conceptually as being the same. It's just that the covariances can, uh, can be larger than 1 or smaller than minus 1. So a covariance measures the linear interactions because correlation also measures the linear interactions, and that's because the dot product is a linear operator. So here we would have uh, some data showing a positive correlation, here's data showing a negative correlation, and here's data showing a zero correlation. Now just a little bit about terminology, this is a little pet peeve of mine. Sometimes people would say there is no correlation between these two variables. That's actually technically not true. Colloquially, we know what people mean when they say that there's no correlation, but there's always a correlation between any two variables that have the same length. There's always a correlation. So it's just you would say that there's a zero correlation. Interestingly, there's also zero correlation here. Now, you look at this and you see, well, there's clearly a relationship between x uh, or variable a and variable b, which is true, but that relationship is nonlinear. And the correlation or the covariance is going to identify only the linear components of the relationship between two variables. So the linear component is going to be zero, even though there is a nonlinear relationship between these two variables. This is a concept that's going to come up again in independent components analysis. So with that as a brief introduction to covariance matrices, I'm now going to tell you a bit about PCA principal components analysis. And the goal of PCA is to compress the data into a smaller number of more meaningful dimensions. Now, when introducing PCA, I often give a analogy of a piece of paper. Imagine you have a piece of paper. Now, a piece of paper is a three-dimensional object. It exists in our three-dimensional world. And okay, maybe you say that our world is really like 11 dimensions or 14 dimensions maybe. <laughs> I don't keep up with uh, all this like uh, quantum entanglement curled up dimension stuff. But just for, you know, for the sake of argument, let's say that our universe is three dimensions, certainly as we experience it, it's three spatial dimensions. So a piece of paper is obviously three dimensional, but there are really only two important dimensions of the piece of paper. So the piece of paper has length and it has thick uh, and it has uh, width, but the, the thickness of a piece of paper is really, really small. It's like much less than a millimeter. We could even measure the thickness of a piece of paper in terms of microns. So orders of magnitude smaller. So we can say, yes, a piece of paper is uh, two dimensional, uh, three dimensional, but we can consider it to be two dimensions. We can ignore the third dimension of a piece of paper. So we start off with something that is in three dimensions and we can reduce it down to two dimensions while basically just ignoring that third dimension. We say that that third dimension is not relevant. So that's kind of the idea of PCA. PCA will find the dimensions that are really, really thin in the data that have very little, very, very little thickness, very little covariance in those dimensions. And that allows us to compress out or ignore those, uh, those data dimensions, those data features. So I'm now going to walk you through the steps to computing a principal components analysis, and I'll explain along the way why those steps are the right thing to do. So step one is to compute the covariance matrix of the data. And I already told you about covariance matrices. You can uh, compute the covariance matrix in a sort of compact linear algebra notation as the data matrix times its transpose. Now, when you're doing a PCA in practice, there are some things you need to keep in mind, like the data should be mean-centered. You have to think about 
the time windows, you might want to apply some temporal filtering. Maybe you, you have some, some bad electrodes or bad sensors or bad pixels or uh, particularly noisy voxels or something like that. So you might need to do a little bit of pre-processing to make sure you have a covariance matrix that is clean, high signal to noise, and only contains the relevant information. Nonetheless, that is step one of performing a principal components analysis. Then we get to step two, which is to perform something called an eigen decomposition of that covariance matrix. Now, I'm sure you've heard the terms eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and uh, eigen decomposition is the linear algebra operation that, uh, that, that gives us those eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Now, if you don't really understand what eigen decomposition means, then don't worry about it. I'm going to walk you through some of the basic uh, ways of thinking about eigen decomposition in the context of PCA. But essentially, what eigen decomposition will do is um, analyze a square matrix. So it only works on square matrices, and covariance matrices are square matrices. And the eigen decomposition will find the important directions in that matrix, or the important features in that matrix. And for the covariance matrix, the eigen decomposition is going to identify the directions, the features in the covariance matrix, like the, the patterns in the covariance matrix that have the most amount of variance across the different channels. So what is the way of combining the data across the different channels that maximizes the correlation across all the different variables? That's what eigen decomposition is going to do. Now, in for the next like minute or so, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the math if you've taken linear algebra before, then you might recognize some of this math. If you haven't, then don't worry about it. You can just focus more on the the, the sort of uh, the, the conceptual aspects and, and not worry so much about the implementation details or the math details. Okay, so what we want to do with principal components analysis is find a vector w that gives us a set of weights for each channel such that when you multiply that vector of weights by the covariance matrix, then you are maximizing this equation. And this equation, uh, or this ratio, is sometimes called the normalized quadratic form. Essentially, it is saying, how do we get the most amount of energy out of this covariance matrix? What is the way of combining information across the different channels to maximize the covariance or the correlation pattern across all of the different channels? And then the reason why we uh, divide by uh, the weight, ve the, the squared magnitude of the weight vector is basically just to pre prevent the numerator from growing infinitely large. You know, you could just set the w's to be huge, huge, huge values, and then this term is going to be huge. So uh, this just keeps the, the, it prevents the equation from just growing infinitely. You could also write that this way, saying maximize w transpose sw such that, or subject to, the uh, length of the weights vector is 1. Okay, so we want to find the way of combining all the different channels such that S is maximized. So let's go back to this picture here. What would be the way of weighting all of these different channels to get the most energy to maximize this matrix? Well, you know, let's just take an example of uh, setting all of the weights except for 1 to be 0. So 0, 0, 0, 0, and let's leave this at 1, this yellow signal here. So this time series uh, times 0 plus this channel times 0 plus this channel times 0. This channel we stay, we leave at a weighting of 1, and all the rest of the channels we turn to 0. So the question is, is just the covariance between this channel and all the other channels being 0, is that going to be the way to maximize the total amount of energy that we have in this matrix? Well, not really, uh, but uh, so let's think about some other ways of combining. We could just set all the channels to be equal to 1, but that's not really efficient either because if we, if we add these channels to these channels, they're going to cancel each other out. So instead, you probably have the intuition that we can multiply these channels by a positive number, multiply these channels by a negative number to flip the signs, and then we can add them together, and that's going to give us the most amount of energy, the most amount of variance in the signal. What about this channel up here? Well, this channel is not correlated with any of the other channels, so we should actually just set 
the variance uh, or the, the weight for this channel to be zero or very, very close to zero. And again, you might be thinking, well, you know, why don't we just set the weight of this thing to be one quadrillion? Well, the problem with that is we need the weights to be small. Uh, that's why we have that uh, subject to W transpose W equals one. So we want to find a way to have the weights in total, the, all of the magnitudes of all the weights, uh, sum to one. And then the weighted combination is going to give us the most amount of variance that we can possibly get out of this signal. And again, in this particular case, it's visually intuitive that we get that by multiplying these guys by a positive number, these guys by a negative number, and then we can add them up, and that's going to give us a large variance. Now, this is a pretty simple case, so I just, you know, we, we can agree that, you know, a uh, positive number, a negative number, and then sum, that's going to be a good result here. In real data sets, it's harder to just, you know, you, you don't just visualize the, the data and say, ah, this is what we need to set the weights to. So that is what the eigen decomposition is going to tell us. The eigen decomposition will tell us exactly how to define the weight values for all the different channels so that the weighted sum over all the channels is maximizing the variance. So how does the eigen decomposition do that? How do we know how to, how to set these weights? So this is where the, the linear algebra stuff comes in. And the solution to this problem comes from thinking about uh, not w as just a vector, but instead coming up with an entire solution of w's. So we make this w from a vector into a matrix, and then we can rewrite this equation as this. So now we have, here we have, uh, so so uh, this arrow sign is a little bit confusing maybe because the output of argmax is actually a w, it's a vector w, and that's the w that maximizes this expression. But when you plug in this formula for the result of argmax, then the result is going to be a single number, which is called lambda, and that's the eigenvalue. So if we write this out in terms of matrices, we can do a little bit of reduction here. And by the way, if you have taken a linear algebra course before, then you should feel free to pause the video and try to simplify this expression and see what happens, assuming you can assume that W is a, uh, a square invertible matrix. Anyway, the result you get to is this thing here. And again, if you haven't taken a linear algebra course, this just looks like, maybe it looks like, you know, a word like Warsaw or something, Warsaw, or something. this could be a shorthand for Warsaw. But uh, if you have taken a linear algebra course, you might recognize this as the fundamental eigenvalue equation expressed as matrices. So basically we do, we play around with the algebra a little bit and we come up with the answer that the solution to maximizing the uh, variance in matrix S, which comes from the data matrix, is given to us by the eigen decomposition on matrix S. And that gives us a matrix of eigenvectors, and this contains the weighting for all of the different channels, and the matrix, a diagonal matrix, lambda, which tells us all of the eigenvalues. Okay, so then we get uh, the uh, eigen decomposition that tells us the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. We sort uh, by eigenvalue magnitude, and that's because uh, the largest eigenvalues tell us the most important directions in the data, the most important ways of combining the information across the different data sets, uh, or across the different channels, and the eigenvectors tell us how to do the actual weighting. Now, once we get the eigenvectors, that gives us the weighting for each of the different channels. So then, what we do with the eigenvectors is use those to multiply the data channels, and that gives us a component time series. So going back to this uh, uh, image that I showed earlier, the idea is that we want to find a number for each data channel such that this channel times that number plus this channel times its number plus this channel times its number and so on. And then we add all of those weighted, uh, weighted combination of all of those different channels together and that gives us our component and our component time series. So now the W, the weightings for each channel comes from an eigen decomposition. So here we have a data set with 256 electrodes. So the covariance matrix will be 256 by 256. And then the eigen decomposition is going to give us an eigenvector with 256 values. And then we multiply each corresponding value by the data channel, add them all up, and that gives us our component. And that's our first principal component. 
So the eigenvector multiplied by the data time series, and then we sum, and that gives us our component time series. And then there's a couple of additional steps, like you can convert the eigenvalues to percent variance explained, uh, and I'll, I'll show that on the next slide. And uh, we can also yeah, make, uh, make images and topographical maps of the eigenvector itself to do some anatomical interpretation. Okay, so after you sort the eigenvalues, you're going to get a plot that looks something like this, where you have the components on the x-axis and the eigenvalue on the y-axis. Now, this can be in raw lambda units, so raw eigenvalue units. This will be the units of the data. Or you can also convert this into percent change. And then you would say, you know, like the first component accounts for maybe this is 70% of the variance of the data. This accounts for, you know, 20% uh, of the variance. This accounts for 5% of the variance. And all these together account for, you know, in total 5% of the variance. So each one is accounting for a tiny fraction of variance. In statistics, you might have seen a plot that looks like this for factor analysis, and there they call it a scree plot, but you don't have to worry about the name. So the idea of looking at this eigenspectrum is we count the number of like big components that are popping out from the rest of the spectrum, and those we say are potentially interesting. These are possibly interpretable. Now, you, there are statistical methods to evaluate each of these eigenvalues to determine whether they are really, you know, uh, statistically interpretable. But for, for now, colloquially, we can just say that the components that pop out of the data, those are, are uh, pop out of the rest of the spectrum. These are the interpretable eigenvalues. So in the example I gave before of a piece of paper, the eigen decomposition of the piece of paper, you would expect one component to be really big. That's like the length of the paper one component to be also kind of big, but a little bit smaller, that would be the width of the paper. And the third eigenvalue you would expect to be really, really small, very close to zero, and that would be the thickness of the paper. And so the eigen decomposition is telling us basically the dimensionality of, not the dimensionality of the data per se, but the dimensionality of the kind of thickness, the fatness of the data, where most of the data lies. So we could look at this plot and say, well, this system, is, you know, although there's there's 21 dimensions in the system, there's only three dimensions that are really important. These dimensions are are containing uh, less variance. There, there's relatively little variability in these later dimensions, just like the thickness of a piece of paper is very thin. So the rest of the spectrum is sometimes called a noise spectrum. I put noise in apology quotes here because we don't actually know if the information in these later dimensions is noisy per se, we just know that they're actually low variance components. Now, they could be important information here. In fact, if you perform a, a PCA on, uh, on data that contain a lot of noise or artifacts, probably the artifacts are going to explain most of the variance. So, in fact, in that case, the signal, the important features of the signal might be down here. But, uh, but anyway, these are components that explain relatively little variance in the total multivariate data set. And with that as an overview of PCA and how to implement PCA, I now want to discuss three limitations of PCA. And just to be clear, these are not necessarily disadvantages of PCA per se. These are limitations of trying to use PCA as a method for source separation, in particular of neuroscience data. Okay, so let's get to the first one. The first one, the first limitation is that principal components are orthogonal. Orthogonal means that they, the different principal components are exactly zero correlated. They are forced by the math to be uh, correlated at exactly zero. So they are all orthogonal to each other. And the reason for that is uh, beyond the scope of this uh, uh, lecture, but it basically just has to do with um, uh, the fact that covariance matrices are symmetric. So eigen decomposition of symmetric matrices is guaranteed to give us orthogonal principal components. So if we think of the uh, dimensions of the data in a geometric sense, it means that they are they meet at a 90 degree angle. In an algebraic sense, it means that the dot product between any pair of uh, principal components is also zero, which therefore means that the correlation coefficient between 
any two principal components is also going to be zero. Now, why is that a problem? You might not think that that's really bad, but it's a limitation because sources are often in the brain. We don't think of the sources as being orthogonal. I'll give an example of this on the next slide, but here we can see this uh, this data set here. So it's two-dimensional data set, and uh, it's pretty clear what's going on here. You know, there's like these two streams of, of data here, so that's really easy to see. These lines are showing the first and the second principal components of this data set. Now, this is not wrong. This is actually the correct answer from the perspective of PCA, because the goal of PCA is to find the directions in the data that maximize the covariance across the different channels. So this direction is the mo contains the most amount of variance, and this direction has the least amount of variance. So, so from the perspective of PCA, this is the correct answer. But I think you have a sense that it's somehow awkward. It's somehow not really the right thing to do. It's not the right set of vectors to identify these sources in the data. Okay, so this is a problem that comes from the orthogonality constraint. And we can also think about this from a cognitive perspective. So if you think about, you know, different kind of cognitive operations that are happening in the brain, like perception and decision making and action, these are not uh, orthogonal things. These are all correlated with each other. They are distinct. You know, the way that you perceive the world is not exactly the same as the way you make decisions about the world. But of course, your decisions are based on your perception and the actions that you take are based on your decisions, which are blah, 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 blah. So these things are all correlated with each other. They're not the same as each other, but they are definitely not orthogonal. By the way, this is terrible posture. If you are sitting like this right now, please sit up. This isn't like really great posture either, but it's somewhere, you know, you gotta mix these two together. Somewhere between these is a uh, good, uh, and since we're all spending so much time at home, I hope you also take uh, some opportunity to force yourself to exercise. Anyway, enough uh, public service announcement for now. Okay, so again, this is not a fundamental problem of principal components analysis. This makes principal components analysis of limited use for doing source separation of data sets where we have a lot of correlations between the different sources. The third limitation of principal components analysis is that it assumes that variance equals relevance. And this I've, I've already been talking about when I introduced the mechanism of PCA. So PCA doesn't know what's important in the data. It just knows what is the highest variance in the data. And the highest sources of variance in the data are not necessarily the most interesting things in the data. And uh, I already gave an example of a data set with artifacts. So uh, if, if there's artifacts in the data, then the principal components analysis is going to say, oh, those artifacts have the highest variance, therefore they must be the most important, which is, yeah, not really the case. This is just an example uh, illustrating, you know, imagine what's the most important feature in this data set is the color dimension. And principal components analysis is not going to be able to separate that color dimension. Uh, because that's that's not the highest uh, source of variance in the data. So then we get to the uh, third limitation of PCA, which is that it is not amenable to hypothesis testing. So PCA is uh, it is possible to do some inferential statistics, but it's not really optimized for inferential statistics. And the reason is that the null hypothesis of PCA is that your covariance matrix equals the identity matrix. And the identity matrix is a matrix that has all ones on the diagonal and importantly, all zeros on the off diagonal. In other words, the null hypothesis of PCA is that all of your data are literally zero correlated with every other channel. So if you measure, you know, 100 neurons from the brain, let's say you measure 100 neurons in V1, and the null hypothesis of principal components analysis is that every one of those 100 neurons has a zero correlation with every other one of those 100 neurons. That's obviously a ridiculous and untenable null hypothesis. Okay, so the take home here is that PCA is a very powerful method for reducing data dimensionality from M, where M is the number of channels, 
uh, or sensors to C, uh, where C is the number of components. And the idea is that, you know, C is the, the way the number, the dimensionality that you're reducing the data to is somewhere in between one and M. But on the other hand, PCA is both theoretically and empirically suboptimal for source separation, where you're trying to get one source. And that's because of these three limitations that I discussed in the previous video. Okay, so with that uh, as the end of my discussion of, of PCA, I'm now going to talk about generalized eigen decomposition, which is actually, uh, you can see it as an extension and improvement over PCA. Now, normally when I teach this lecture live in person, this is the time where we would pause to take a break of around 10 minutes or 15 minutes or something. Now, of course, you are uh, you have control over the playback, so maybe you already took a long break or whatever, but if you haven't already, then uh, now is a good time to pause the video, have a stretch, you know, drink some coffee or whatever you'd like to do. And when we come back, we're going to talk about generalized eigen decomposition and then independent components analysis. I'm going to begin the discussion of generalized eigen decomposition by motivating it using uh, basically, you know, what we do in science, which is design experiments that test specific hypotheses that have different control conditions and so on. So in science, we have hypotheses, we have controls, and we want to make comparisons between different experimental conditions. So, you know, this group of trials versus this group of trials is like from the Stroop task. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a source separation method that allowed for hypothesis testing and inferential statistics? So wouldn't it be nice if we could say, you know, show me or give me a set of weights for the different data channels or the different neurons or the different uh, brain readouts and behavioral readouts that maximally separated this group of trials from this group of trials. So this experimental condition from this experimental condition. Or maybe uh, we want uh, to separate different time windows. So here we say, uh, you know, this is like when a, a stimulus appeared on the screen, here's when another stimulus appeared on the screen. And here the screen was blank and here the screen was blank. And these all correspond to, or each line here is a different data channel recorded from V1. So we can also say, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a source separation method that would tell us what is different about the processing in this time window compared to this time window. That's an important uh, distinction because there, there's a lot of, uh, there's going to be uh, relationships across the different channels in this time window that maybe isn't very interesting. This is just some intrinsic ongoing connectivity that isn't particularly related to active visual processing. And uh, that kind of background structure in the data is present in both of these windows. Now, principal components analysis does not allow us to, uh, to, uh, to custom tailor a spatial filter to separate out these two different time windows, but uh, generalized eigen decomposition does. So, uh, so we, we want something that can allow us to compare two different time windows uh, or maybe two different frequencies if we are particularly interested in the alpha band and we want to ignore the rest of the spectrum or all the activity happening at other frequencies. We want a way to, uh, to do source separation based on that as well. And that's the idea of generalized eigen decomposition. It is a source separation method and also a dimension reduction method that is fundamentally hypothesis driven. So we can specify hypotheses while designing a data driven uh, spatial filter. So uh, you see uh, lots of applications of generalized eigen decomposition in machine learning uh, as linear classifiers. So there's lots of linear classifiers like uh, discriminant analysis and Fisher uh, linear discriminators. Those are all based on generalized eigen decomposition. If you've heard of BCI or brain computer interface, brain computer interfaces are basically a way to, you know, hook up your brain to, uh, to yeah, something like EEG or uh, fMRI. And then there's going to be a system that will, will interpret your brain data and try to, uh, you know, drive a robot or operate a, uh, a keyboard on the screen or, you know, interact with a mouse or something like that. So that's a brain computer interface. And that's uh, many BCI methods are also 
based on generalized eigen decomposition at the core. So it's a very versatile method that's actually used quite often, even if you haven't heard of the, the like mathy term itself. So generalized eigen decomposition works in a similar way to principal components analysis. Remember, with principal components analysis, we were looking for the channel weighting, the, the, the vector w, the weighting of all the channels that maximizes the covariance energy of matrix S, covariance matrix S. Here, with generalized eigen decomposition, we just make a minor tweak, a little addition, where we put another covariance matrix into the denominator here. So now, what we are looking for is not uh, a vector that maximizes the covariance per se, we are looking for a vector that maximizes this ratio between covariance matrix S and covariance matrix R. So you can think of this as kind of like a signal to noise ratio. If uh, this is your a covariance matrix coming from the signal, and this is a covariance matrix coming from a, a part of the signal that's noise. So it's still the, all the same channels, same data set, uh, but from, you know, maybe this is from the uh, stimulus uh, period and this is from a baseline period. And now in this case, the null hypothesis is that S equals R. And in fact, we can already predict what the null hypothesis value is going to be, what lambda is going to be the eigenvalue, if S and R are equal or, you know, roughly equal. So there, we would expect this ratio to be one. We expect the lambda value to be one. So that's our null hypothesis value. So if we find that lambda is large, then that suggests that uh, there is some unique information in matrix S that is not present in covariance matrix R. So just going back to this example, uh, we can create uh, a covariance matrix R from these data in this time window, and covariance matrix R from the data in this time, uh, excuse me, covariance matrix S from the, uh, the data in this time window. So now we are comparing uh, this time window against this time window, and that's going to give us our uh, spatial filter here, our eigenvector. Now the rest of the uh, generalized eigen decomposition works pretty similarly to how uh, principal components analysis works, except in the end, we end up with an extra matrix R over here. So this is not an eigenvalue equation. This is now something called a generalized eigenvalue equation. And now it turns out that uh, this matrix here, R inverse times S, this is not a symmetric matrix. Even though both S and R are symmetric matrices, when you multiply them together, they're not going to be symmetric. And that is important because remember I said that limitation number one of principal components analysis is that sources in the brain are rarely orthogonal and yet principal components are forced to be orthogonal. Well, that uh, that that constraint on PCA is because uh, of uh, uh, of what happens when you do an eigen decomposition of a symmetric matrix. Here we have a non-symmetric matrix, and so orthogonality constraint goes out the window. So that means that generalized eigen vectors are not are the eigen vectors from a generalized eigen decomposition are actually not constrained to be orthogonal. They could be orthogonal if the data happen to be orthogonal, if the sources happen to be orthogonal, but there's certainly no constraints on orthogonality. Okay, so let me show you what uh, generalized eigen decomposition looks like in pictures. Here we have uh, two covariance matrices, R and S, and this is the diagonal matrix of lambdas or the eigenvalues, and uh, these are the uh, eigenvectors matrix. So this is the um, first eigenvector, they're in the columns, the second eigenvector, and so on. So what the eigen decomposition is going to do is analyze this matrix and analyze this matrix, and it will look for patterns that separate this matrix from this matrix. Now you look at this and you see that they look pretty similar to each other. Obviously not identical, it's easy to see where they're separate, uh, but they look pretty similar to each other. They're overall similar. Now that is an interesting difference between PCA and GED because GED, so PCA is going to say, well, what are the overall patterns in here? And GED will say, well, you know, I don't care about anything that's common between R and S. You know, whatever is, whatever structure, whatever patterns are in both of these matrices, 
I don't care about. I'm going to completely ignore those. Instead, I just want to know what is unique in this matrix that is not present in this matrix. And that is what the first eigenvector is going to tell us. Now I'm going to show you a few screenshots from MATLAB where I simulated data and then I uh, tried to recover the underlying sources using PCA, GED, and ICA. And I'll talk more about ICA in a few moments. Now, I'm a big fan of simulating data because when you simulate data uh, to test and evaluate uh, data analysis methods, when you simulate data, you know what the ground truth is. So you can, you can determine whether you've gotten the correct result from your data analysis method. In real data, of course, you know, you have some some rubrics, you have some some guides to, to tell you whether you're on, on the right track, but ultimately you never really know what's the truth in empirical, uh, in real data. Okay, so the way that I, so let me first tell you about how I simulated these data and then I'll walk you through the results. So what you're looking at here is a brain of dots. So I hope you see that there's, uh, I hope you see the, the brain uh, structure in here. So this is the, this would be the left temporal pole, the right temporal pole, Here's the front of the brain. This would be occipital cortex back here. This is the top of the brain. So we have a brain of dipoles. This is simulating EEG in dipoles in gray matter. And then I picked one dipole in particular to be relevant. And that's this one, which is in yellow here. You can see it popping out there. And then what I did was um, have a, a forward model that shows uh, what the signal would look like at the scalp so this would be a scalp map with the numbers corresponding to EEG electrodes. What would the scalp data look like if I have activity in this one dipole and zero activity everywhere else in the brain? So the whole brain is quiet and only this one dipole is active. Well, that would project to the scalp and it would produce a topographical map that looks like this. Okay, so this is kind of like what's going on in the brain, grossly oversimplified, of course, but in the brain, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, electrical dipoles or equivalent dipoles. They produce electrical fields which propagate through, uh, through you know, brain tissue and skull and skin, and they're measured at the scalp. The electrical fields are measured at the scalp. So this is our true underlying sources. These are our latent constructs. And of course, normally we don't have direct access to these latent constructs, but this is simulated data, so we actually do. These are our manifest variables. These are the sensors that we can actually measure and convert data into numbers that we can analyze. Okay, so here's what I did. I simulated uh, this pattern of activity, the, the, this like cyan bluish line in this dipole. So it's basically just a flat line for half a second and then half a second of a 10 hertz sine wave. And you can see I added a little bit of noise to that and there was noise in all of the other 2,000 dipoles. And then I project the activity from all the 2,000 dipoles out to the scalp. Now here's the thing. There's 2,000 dipoles and 64 electrodes, so there's a ton of mixing. Each electrode is re recording activity from all 2,000 dipoles. Now they're not all weighted the same, of course. The, the dipoles that are really close to the electrodes have more impact, and dipoles that are further away have very little impact. But still, there's a ton of mixing going on here. So when you uh, simulate the data this way and project the dipole time series out to the scalp, then you can pick an electrode, and that's what uh, this is the activity that you measure from the electrode. And I think I picked electrode 31 because that's the, the brightest one here. So first of all, it's pretty remarkable to see that uh, you know, what you get at the, at the electrode level is much, much noisier because it's mixing together signals from lots of these different dipoles all over the place. And, you know, if you look carefully, you can see that the electrode activity is, is following the dipole activity. So we do see a little bit of the dipole activity uh, in, the, in this one electrode. But obviously, this is not really super great. So we want to see if we can improve on this a little bit. Okay, so what I did was run a principal components analysis on the data. So this is the truth topographical map. This is the ground truth. This is the uh, principal components. Uh, this is the, the eigenvector from principal components analysis. Now, this doesn't look anything like this. So that tells you that, uh, we, that PCA didn't do a very good job at recovering the ground truth topographical map. 
here you see the scree plot. And it looks from here like there's, you know, one, two, three, three or four important components in the data set. That's what the PCA is suggesting. Here you see the time series. Uh, let's see, so orange. So again, the, the blue is the, the ground truth data. Uh, the EEG is the electrode, it's electrode 31. And it's the, exactly the same thing that I showed in the previous slide, just separated on the y-axis. And then in the orange, we have the principal component time series. This is the, the, the weighted sum of all the electrodes. Now you already see that this doesn't look like this. And so you don't really expect this orange time series to look like the blue time series. In fact, if anything, just picking one EEG electrode seems to be better in this, you know, I wouldn't generalize this to all cases, but in this particular simulation, the one EEG electrode appears to be closer to the ground truth than the PCA for the top component up here. Now, why do you get all this? I mean, it should only be one component because there's only one source of signal in the brain. Everything else is noise. Well, it turns out that in the forward model, so the mapping from dipoles to the, uh, to the EEG electrode, there is spatial structure in there. And that's partly because of the locations and orientations of the dipoles in the brain and partly because uh, we don't have electrodes all the way around the brain. We only have electrodes on the scalp, you know, mostly like above the ears. So, uh, so we, we're, we're, we have some limitations here. And basically that means that they're just in the, uh, the forward model in this physical mapping from dipole location to electrodes, there already is structure in that uh, data. And that's basically what the PCA is recovering, just the fact that there is already some, uh, some anatomical biophysical structure in the forward model. So that's why we get this. It's not very reflective of the actual dynamics in the data. Okay, so that's PCA. Uh, then we get to generalized eigen decomposition. And remember in GED, we have to specify two covariance matrices. So I created one covariance matrix from, uh, from 0.5 to one, and then another covariance matrix that was R from the, this, yeah, this earlier time window here. And now what's interesting, so, I mean, you see that the generalized eigen decomposition top, uh, to topographical map is nearly identical to the ground truth. And this, the scree plot here shows one huge component and everything else is tiny down here. And uh, the time series signal looks really good. It's not perfect. You know, we still have a little bit of noise mixed in, but it looks really good. That's very impressive, I think. And the reason why this works so well is that all of the common features across the data, which are basically just given by the anatomical constraints of the forward model, the physical forward model, all of those features are present in this time window and in this time window. So those get canceled out because remember, the generalized eigen decomposition is solving for an equation of S divided by R. So the covariance here versus the covariance here. So anything that is common, all the common patterns get obliterated. They get ignored, which is not the case for PCA. Okay, so generalized eigen decomposition does super well here. We get an accurate reconstruction of the data. Here is the result from uh, independent components analysis, which uh, I don't really need to say. I think it's pretty obvious that it's doing a pretty crappy job in this particular case. Now, let's not say that ICA uh, it isn't a good method. ICA is a great method. You'll probably learn about it more in uh, yeah in uh, other lectures. But um, in this particular simulation, it doesn't do a very good job. And I will talk a little bit about why that probably is the case when I talk about independent components analysis. So with this slide, I just want to remind you. So we talked about PCA and GED. Uh, PCA is trying to maximize covariance power Generalized eigen decomposition is uh, looking for, uh, is maximizing a multivariate signal to noise ratio. So PCA and, and GED, you can see they're very close to each other. Mathematically, they're very related to each other. You can think of PCA as being a kind of special case, a simplified version of GED, where the R matrix is the identity matrix. Okay, so now let me tell you about ICA, independent components analysis. It's uh, a blind source separation method and is based on the assumption that signals are non-Gaussian distributed. ICA is used a lot 
for um, artifact detection and artifact removal. It's used for sound localization for chemometrics. And uh, oh yeah, well also for the large scale structure of the visible universe. So in fact, people have used astronomers have used independent components analysis to understand the uh, the structure of the residual radiation from the the you know the the background uh, microwave radiation that resulted from the Big Bang. So ICA has a lot of uh, applications and it's played an important role in signal processing and image processing throughout uh, the past, let's say, 40, 50 years or so. So here I want to give you an example of what some independent components analysis uh, results might look like. So here you see some topographical maps. This shows you basically how all the different channels are weighted to combine one time series. Remember that ICA is a spatial filter similar to PCA, similar to GED. So the, the idea, the goal is that we want to have a weight for each individual channel such that the weighted combination, the weighted sum of all the channel data gives us a single uh, time series, a single number per time point, and also this topography. So this is what the topography of the component looks like. This is what the time series looks like. So it's a weighted combination of all of these channels, and this shows you what the pattern of the weights looks like. So you can see this one has uh, uh, large values all the way towards the face, and it turns out that this is like EOG. So this is telling us about the, the eye blinks. So it, this component is isolating a source coming from the eye blinks. And here's an, another component that's also isolating the eye blinks. This one uh, they call theta here because I guess if you do a power spectrum of this component, it's going to have rhythmicity in theta, which is around 6 hertz. And this one is an alpha component. You see these really sharp alpha waves in here and so on for all of these different uh, components, isolating different sources of signal, theta and alpha, and this is isolating different sources of noise. Here we have blinks, and here we have EMG, which is muscle activity, ECG, uh, AKA EKG, which is the uh, heartbeat. So you can see the, the heartbeat here in the, uh, in, in, the, in the data. So how does ICA work? Well, there are several different, I don't know, maybe like a dozen different uh, algorithms for ICA, and they work slightly differently. They all key off of slightly different uh, uh, features of the data, and they maximize slightly different things. So I'm going to walk you through the general idea of how ICA algorithms work without focusing on any specific algorithm in particular. Uh, or, and uh, also because of that, without getting into too much mathematical detail. Okay, so we start with this guy, Gauss, and you all know the Gaussian distribution, the bell curve, the normal standard dif uh, distribution. And basically ICA says, well, Gaussian is bad. And what, well, you know, it doesn't say that Gauss is bad. It just says that a Gaussian distribution is bad. And okay, so maybe that doesn't make Gauss very happy, but uh, why do we make this assumption? So this assumption is based on um, observations, so empirical observations, and also theoretical principles that that signals are tend to be non-Gaussian distributed. For example, they might have very uh, a, a very you know low number of very large scale events. So signals are non-Gaussian distributed. In contrast, ICA assumes that a noise, random noise, is Gaussian distributed, and that random mixtures of signals are Gaussian distributed. Now, part of this uh, assumption it comes from the central limit theorem. That basically, you know, the central limit theorem is a really important theorem in statistics and in signal processing. The central limit theorem just says that if you pick a lot of stuff randomly from the universe and put it all into a pile, that pile is going to start looking like a Gaussian distribution. So ICA says, well, you know, if you see a Gaussian distribution, then maybe that's because we're randomly putting different things, we're randomly mixing things together into the same pile. So we need to come up with a way to uh, to separate the, the, the sources, unmix the different sources that are mixed together by making sure that individual sources are non-Gaussian, have non-Gaussian distributions. Okay, so here we see a little example of this in this slide. This comes from this uh, paper, if you're curious to learn about uh, or to read about the Jade algorithm. That's one of the uh, popular algorithms for ICA. 
can check out this paper. It's it's pretty uh, approachable. You, you don't have to read it, but just the citation here. Okay, so here what you see is different sources of data. So we have this source, which uh, I think is just a bunch of ones and minus ones successively. This source, which looks like a phase angle time series, that's so just a sawtooth thing. And this is a pure sine wave. Here you see the histograms of these different signals. Now, notice that none of these histograms is Gaussian. These are, this is like the opposite of Gaussian. This is also totally non-Gaussian, non-Gaussian, non-Gaussian. All of these signals are non-Gaussian distributed. But when you mix them all together, so you just randomly start mixing these signals together, their combined mixed histograms will start to look like Gaussians. And that's what you see here. So these are the distributions of all of these things randomly mixed together. And this is essentially, you know, this is like an, a little example of the central limit theorem, uh, telling us that, you know, these random things put together and they will start looking like a Gaussian. So again, ICA is going to look at this and say, well, I believe, you know, I being the ICA algorithm, I believe that uh, if we would come up with a different way of weighting the different uh, input channels here, then we could find a way of weighting them that would maximize non-Gaussian distributions. Or you could also say, you know, make these distributions be as, as little like a Gaussian as possible. So maximize non-Gaussianity. And that is what I believe, I as the ICA algorithm, that is what I believe is going to recover the sources in the data. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through a little uh, a, a diagram of uh, some data, uh, starting from source data, and then we're going to mix them together, and we'll see what ICA is going to do. Okay, so these are uh, our original data. We call the original variables S and T. And let's say that in the real world, these two variables are uncorrelated with each other. Or maybe, you know, th there's a little bit of correlation. It doesn't actually matter. Uh, S and T are distinct variables, but they get mixed together. So S and T, maybe this is the activity in two different dipoles of the brain. But then these two dipoles project onto the scalp. And let's say we have two electrodes, electrode X and electrode Y. And so in this projection process, going from the source, the true underlying ground source, the latent construct source uh, space, into the uh, the actual data space where, we're, where we, we have some mixing here. So now we have a really strong correlation between these two variables. You can see the source axes. This is axis S and this is axis T. They get correlated in our data space because of this mixing from uh, source to, to channels, to uh, manifest variables. Okay, so the first thing we do with ICA is what's called whiten the data to remove the covariances. And the way that works is by taking a PCA of the data and we just uh, do a little bit of inversion and that removes all of the correlated structure of the data. So this would be our data in principal component space. So you can see that we haven't done any, uh, any stretching or pulling. All we do is rotate this axis so that PC1 and PC2, where the data are now uncorrelated. Now, this gets back to what I mentioned towards the beginning of this video, where I was talking about uh, covariance and correlation uh, only capturing the linear components of, of, of data, which is not the same thing as any possible relationship between the two variables. So there's definitely a relationship between these two, uh, between these two variables but now the correlation coefficient is zero. So there's zero correlation coefficient, but there are still relationships between these two variables. Anyway, here you see the, the marginal distributions. So this is basically, you know, if you would project all these data down onto PC1 and look at the histogram, that would look like this blue line here. And if you project all of these data over to PC2, that would give you this orange histogram that you see over here. So. Again, uh, ICA is going to look at this and say, well, you know, this one, it's not formally a Gaussian. It's a little bit thin for a Gaussian, but it looks kind of Gaussian-ish. So I am unhappy with this distribution. This one looks pretty good. It looks strongly non-Gaussian. So I am going to be pretty happy with this distribution. Okay, 
uh, oh yeah, so linear dependencies are removed, the correlation coefficient is zero, but the shared information is preserved. Okay, so then we want uh, to rotate the axes, but we can rotate each axis separately from each other. And we want to rotate them in a way that minimizes the shared information across the two channels like this, uh, or across the principal components. So now we can actually rotate, uh, we can like pull apart, we can do oblique rotations to, uh, to minimize the shared information. And that's going to give us two distributions, histograms that now look like this. So again, this distribution here, this blue line, corresponds to projecting all the data down onto this axis and making a histogram on the IC1 axis or independent components one. So this is, you know, a quick overview, but it's essentially uh, how ICA, uh, how many ICA algorithms work. So uh, we start with our mixed data, we decorrelate them uh, to remove the, the, the linear dependencies, but uh, shared information is preserved. And then these different principal component axes are then rotated, they're, they're, they're stretched, they don't have to rotate uh, by 90 degrees, they are rotated so that the information uh, across the different channels is minim uh, across the different um, directions is minimized. And what that does is maximize the non Gaussianity of the distribution. So ultimately, we get histograms that look very non Gaussian, and we get our independent components here. And by the way, it's interesting to compare this, the data here in this IC space to the original source space S and T. Remember, this is, uh, you know, these are simulated data, I just made up these data. So it's, it's easy to compare and to recover to see if we've, uh, if we've done a good job. In real data, you start with this. So you know, you get this result, and you don't really know if that's giving you the truth, because uh, yeah, you, you don't have access to the underlying truth. But anyway, so this is certainly rotated, but you can imagine rotating this in your mind, you know, you rotate this uh, clockwise 90 degrees. And I think you'll see that that these data map onto these data really, really well, maybe not perfectly, but really, really closely. So in this case, ICA has done a really good job. And ICA worked really well, because I simulated these data to be exactly uh, to exactly conform to the uh, assumptions underlying independent components analysis. So uh, strongly non Gaussian sources, and then they get linearly mixed. Now you might be wondering why ICA didn't do a good job in this case in the simulated data. Well, that has to do with the assumptions of ICA and some of the ways that uh, narrowband data tend to be distributed. So if we look uh, at some uh, distribution, some histograms of sine waves, and we can get some insight into uh, what's going on here. So what you're looking at here in these three colors, this is the frequency domain, this is the time domain, and this is the distribution domain. So here we have a power spectrum showing uh, basically just one little spike, one delta, one impulse at some particular frequency. So this, this in the frequency domain, in the time domain that ends up being a pure sine wave. And then the histogram of a pure sine wave is this and this looks very strongly non Gaussian. So ICA would would look for something like this would identify this distribution as being something uh, worthy of being a signal. Okay, and then if we widen this full width at half maximum, it's basically just the uh, how wide uh, this little Gaussian thing is, you can see that as we get to wider signals, then the data start looking more, more, well, more biological, although these are all simulated data, but it looks more interesting, it looks more biological, it looks a little bit more like what we find in, uh, in, in, in real uh, neuroscience data. And you can also see that the distributions, the histograms of these time series signals are actually getting more Gaussian, you know, this one, looks like a, a pretty good Gaussian. This is uh, a wider Gaussian, maybe this one is a little bit less Gaussian. But you can see that there is some, uh, some, some region of this parameter space, where we have signals that look biological, and their histograms or distributions appear to be quite Gaussian. So this is not the kind of data feature that ICA is going to be looking for. In fact, ICA will look at this and it will try to decouple uh, this, it will try to break up this kind of distribution based on the assumption uh, 
that uh, these Gaussian distributions are either noise or random mixtures of signals that need to be unmixed. All right, so now you've learned about PCA, GED, and ICA. And these are not the only spatial filters that are out there, but I think these are the ones that are the most commonly used. So it's important to have a, a you know, at least a decent grasp on all three of these methods. And uh, yeah, so I guess the, the more general point that I want to make here is really about these first two columns. So different spatial filters make different assumptions about the data and about the sources underlying the data, and therefore they will maximize different features of the data. And therefore, they are not necessarily going to give you the same results. If you have simulated data where the data are very simple, uh, then you know you can sort of custom tailor the, the, the data where ICA will give you accurate results and maybe not these two, or where GED will give you accurate results and maybe not uh, either of these two. In real data, things are much more complicated and in practice, you're going to find that if you apply ICA, PCA, and GED on the same data, you might get similar results, but you might also get very different results. And that's because there's a lot of things, there's a lot of sources happening in real data, and none of these is, yeah, or I should say, these different uh, methods are going to highlight different features of the data. I'd like to close this lecture with an almost philosophical discussion about uh, dimensionality, reducing dimensionality uh, as a strategy for isolating sources in the brain or just for dealing with large data sets in general. So the question is, what is this shape? What are we looking at here? Now this almost seems, you know, you're, you're probably hesitating because you know it's going to be a trick. And uh, well, obviously it's not a square, you know, but you're probably thinking that it's a, it's an oval, right? So Sure, it seems pretty clear that this is an oval, but actually, what if I told you this was just a dimensionality reduced representation of the three-dimensional world? Now, what would that three-dimensional object be? Well, of course, you have no idea, but maybe I show you this picture. And then you see, okay, so it's actually deceptive that we called this an oval because a Ferris wheel, of course, is not an oval. A Ferris wheel is, well, if you look at it from, from the front side, it's a circle, right? So a Ferris wheel is, well, we can just think about a Ferris wheel as being a bunch of circles connected to each other. So the projection of that three-dimensional circle down to two dimensions was not a circle. It was an oval. Now, is this the wrong representation of the data? It's hard to say. I mean, when you look at this picture, you know, this oval is accurate because that's really capturing the way, you know, the perspective of the image being projected from a three-dimensional world down onto a two-dimensional world. But I'm sure you also agree that there's something misleading. There's something that's not quite right about this, uh, the way that we've done this dimension reduction from three dimensions down to two dimensions. Now, in this particular case, we have a three-dimensional object projecting down to two dimensions. So we can just look at the thing, you know, we just look at the picture and we can qualitatively determine whether the, uh, the dimensionality reduced version is a good representation, is an accurate representation. Now, in three dimensions, that's possible. In two dimensions, that's possible. Once you get up to four dimensions, you're screwed, basically. You know, we have, even in the simulated uh, EEG data that I showed a few moments ago, that was 64 dimensional. So to know if we've gotten the right results, we would have to be able to visualize the data in 64 dimensional space, which is just not something that us, you know, limited humans are capable of doing. So in real data, you it's, it's hard to know if the way that you're reducing dimensionality, the way you're doing uh, so, uh, source separation is really um, accurate and true to the thing that you are really trying to measure, the underlying complex system. Here's a, we can make a similar argument for uh, clustering methods. So this is uh, some data and uh, this is the result of k-means clustering and, uh, and another algorithm called op optics, which is related to something called dbscan in case you, you might have heard of dbscan and not optics. But anyway, it doesn't matter. This is based on local proximity. This is based on uh, a distance to a to a centroid, uh, 
And now the question is, which one of these is right and which is wrong? Well, you know, when you first look at this problem, your immediate thought is probably that k-means is wrong and optics is correct. But if you think about it more, you don't really know that. I mean, that's that's based on an assumption, this Gestalt principle of of you know of local proximity. But we don't actually know. It could be that this is the true uh, clustering method. You know, maybe these these are trees. Each one of these dots is a tree, and this is the property line. So maybe this is actually the true method, and this is uh, or the true result, and this is the incorrect result. So you you don't actually know without knowing more about the underlying data. Uh, the structure, the origin of the data. It's hard to know whether your analysis method is correct. You're just, you apply different analysis methods and you're you're bound to get different results. Same thing here. You know, PCA and ICA are both giving the correct answer, but they're answering different questions. PCA is answering the question of uh, where is the most variance, which is really along this line. And ICA is asking the question of how do I uh, unmix these, uh, you know, how do I find basis vectors that unmix these two uh, distributions? So very, very different answers. They are both equally correct, but they are both answering different questions. Same thing here, both equally correct answers, but they are, they are, they have different constraints and make different assumptions. And so with that, I'm going to close this lecture on uh, this slide again, and basically just uh, reiterating this point that it's these latent constructs, these true sources that we are really interested in. These are the things in the brain that we want to learn about, that we want to study, but we cannot directly measure them. Instead, we can only directly measure the manifest variables. These are electrodes, these are neurons, these are pupil diameter measurements, these are items on a questionnaire. And what we have to do is figure out what are the optimal ways to uh, combine the information from all the different data points that we've measured to be able to reconstruct some components. And you've seen in the previous video and in this video that it's not necessarily trivial to figure out how to create these different weights.